Okay, let's turn with me to uh, Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse uh, 15. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you even as we enter into 2024. Again, we want to hear your very heart. Your very word says that you as year. Let me hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now we know that your word is a lamp unto our feet and, our, and a light unto our path. We want to receive your very rhema word, <coughs> even of now, because we need your direction, we need your guidance. More than just for such a time as this, but as your very people called by your name, the name of Jesus, we want to fully align even with your word so that we will walk and also run with you and partnership with you even in this time. Thank you that you are speaking. Thank you that you have been highlighting and emphasizing unto us more than just over the last few years, but even this decade and even <clears throat> the, the decade to come. Lord, we pray for more than just the receiving of your word. We want to be more than just the hearing of your word, but the doing of your word so that we can become, we can arise to be the very people that you are raising up even in this time, partnering with you to be that burning and the shining lamb. So we commit this time unto you. Again, we ask for your word to go forth swiftly like fire, like hammer. Let it come like hammer that remove every hindrance or all things that hinder wholeheartedness and stepping even unto that fullness. Let it come even like fire. We, want, we need even your empowerment. We need the fire in our heart and also in our spirit so that we will have that supernatural grace and empowerment <coughs> to stay faithful and to run with you until the very end. So we commit this time unto you. Let your word run swiftly, O oh God. Let the word glorify your name and also... <clears throat> causing <clears throat> your kingdom to advance and establish in us and through us. We love you, we bless you, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, turn with me to uh, Jeremiah 3, verse 15. We are on the second session of the birth of the Lord for 2024. Uh, I say that I may take four or five sessions. I may take longer than that because uh, there's so much things that uh, the Spirit of God is saying. And uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes we say it's surprise, but we also shouldn't be surprised that uh, throughout the corporate body of Christ, different streams, different prophetic uh, uh, circle, uh, there is a consistent word that God is saying, even in this time. That like what we say last week, you know, is a season open door. You know, uh, I mean, after that, the last few days, I've been receiving very credible words that you know seems like there is that oneness and unison. We all agree that this is really the season open door. You know, so. Uh, like we always say, you know, the word of God is never, no one has so copyright, you know, and if it's really the very word of God, uh, God will trumpet even to different, different part of the body of Christ and different, different streams because uh, more and more, God is more than just aligning us to him. Uh, more and more, he's aligning every one of us together so that in oneness, the John 17 oneness, we truly, firstly, of course, partner with God, align with God, and then, of course, partner and uh, align with one another. But more importantly, you know, I constantly say, you know, to hear, to know the word is uh, crucial, but even more importantly, is uh, we have to respond, you know, with intentionality, 
and also the specific application or response that God requires of us. You know, uh, I've been always saying, using these two verses, one is of course Mark 4, 24, another one is Luke 8, verse 18. Prime, both of them are really given, I mean of course spoken by Jesus, but given in the context of the parable of the sower about hearing the word and receiving the word. Mark 4, verse 24 says, Take heed what you hear. Okay. Of course, we want to hear what God is saying. That's the reason why we constantly lean even unto the bosom of Jesus, whether it's by Apostle John or Mary of Bethany. We want to receive the very living Word of God because truly the living Word of God is, a- is able to lead and guide us, especially in this very exciting time, very sobering time, and very serious time. All the more we need that living Rhema Word of God. Mark 4, 24 says, Take heed what you hear. You know, what, we, what we hear specifically is very important, but even more important is after we hear, we have to be intentional in responding. That's why Luke 8, verse 18, you know, is uh, of course again, <clears throat> is in the context of uh, parable of the sower. It's, always, it's also about receiving the very uh, uh, word of God, no? but this time the emphasis is not so much just hearing the right thing. Hearing the right thing is important, but responding right, responding in accordance to what the word of God say and want us to respond and with intentionality, not being casual or even negligent, you know, uh, that's where we're going to walk into the very fullness of God. You know? If you read Luke, uh, 8 verse 6 and verse 13 talk about the seed being sown into the rocky place. Okay, The issue is that uh, uh, often we receive the very word of God. Okay, We didn't moisture it or we didn't respond. That's why the root uh, doesn't take doesn't go deep into the soil. When challenges come, we immediately wither away. That's why it's so important for us to hear correctly and also respond rightly in accordance with the very heart of God. Okay, so we're going to continue on uh, the very word of the Lord. Today is the second uh, session. You know, all, all are linked together, connected, and in relation with uh, 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 many of the words that God has been spoken to us, especially over the last uh, uh, seven or eight years. You know, uh, uh, we, we cannot treat it or look at it in isolation uh, because all are connected. And in relation to what God is saying in this decade, how should we respond? And all, uh, even more importantly, uh, what is going to come in the decade of 2030s and even uh, beyond? You know, we say, it's, it's, it's a, my friend is asking me, you know, 2015, you say, uh, 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 the statement, the storm is coming, you know, it's like a classic uh, statement. Now, do you have a new one? I say, I'm not God, you know, uh, unless God give a... We, no, the, no I, I'm, I'm, I'm just being serious. We do not want to add nor subtract. Neither do we want to make the word fanciful, you know. Uh, if, if it's a very word of the Lord, we would not try to massage it to, nick, to mix it uh, here sounds nice and so I think there's a place to improve the language. We want to take the word as it is, you know. So I say, you know, it's a very long statement for this this decade. You know, it's a historic transition. Uh, we are in the historic transitional decade, which require the preparation for the times, you know, because of the seriousness and the glorious time that's coming, uh, so that we are ready even to partner with God or even face the challenge as we enter even into the new era, okay? So uh, uh, these are really the word for this decade and even unto uh, 2030s, okay? I want to paint the context, before I talk about uh, uh, what we're going to talk about today, in fact, uh, next few sessions, understanding the context which we talked about last week is going to be very important. Last week, I say that we are in the Kairos time or even season of uh, 
open doors. Okay, I said earlier, uh, consistently, there are many prophetic people are actually saying the same word, you know, uh, cr very credible. So it's for sure, uh, we know that uh, uh, this is a season of open door and God is inviting us both to ascend and to enter into. Because last week I said that there are, there are two aspects when the doors are open. Okay, of course, there is that vertical door where God wants us to ascend, uh, uh, the vertical door of glory. And then, of course, there is the horizontal door where we are, en we are invited to enter even, the, in, even in the destiny that God has prepared for us. You know? That's the reason why I'm going to take the next, uh, today, next Friday, and also... Uh, 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 the subsequent Friday, they have their Chinese New Year already. Uh, okay, uh, really? Uh, wow, you know, here comes. Uh, uh, next, uh, uh, next three Fridays, really talk about that door, that, or rather doors that God wants us to enter unto. Primarily our destiny. The very kind of people that God is raising up uh, 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 by 2030 and even unto the end of the age. You know, whether you can call it the David generations, the Gideon's army, uh, the Daniel 11, 32, 33 people, and so on and so on. Okay? There are many taglines, but they are all the same. No, there are different variations. So I'm going to talk about that, that the kind of people that God is raising up, but even more importantly, more than just knowing that the horizontal door that we are entering into, the destiny. Okay, it's like I say, it's one thing to know, but even more importantly, the process to enter into. Because it's nice and exciting to look at the door and say, wow, you know, this is exciting, this is where, where we are heading and so on. But we need to know the process so that more than just aware, we, at, we actually enter unto, we possess our inheritance, we become the very kind of people that God is looking for. Today, I primarily want to talk about uh, Psalms 18. Psalms 18, primarily is about the David generation. I explained to you. Because many people always ask, you know, so are we the Joshua generation? Are we the Daniel generation? Are we the Moses generation? Or are we the Joseph generation? Okay, especially for the end of the age, for the end time generation. The Bible is very clear. We are called the David generation. That's why this, this is going to be very critical for us to understand that God, even in this time, in this season, are preparing and raising, raises us up to be the end time David generation. So today, primarily, I want to talk about Psalms 18. Psalms 18 is going to be very critical. Psalms 18 is actually the doorway to become the David generation. I'll explain to you much later, okay? Or not much later, slightly later. Okay, next week, I will want to talk about Judges chapter 6. Because Judges chapter 6 and 7 primarily describe Gideon. Okay, that is a very important promise more, now it's more than 40 years ago to this man called Howard Pittman who God brought him uh, before his very throne in heaven and God sent him back and tell him specifically, specifically that this is the time that God is raising up the Gideon's army. If now is the open door for us to enter unto our destiny, we need to know who is the Gideon's army. How do we become the Gideon's army? How does the Gideon's army look like? See, we have gone beyond just, oh yeah, I'm the Gideon's army and so on, so on. What does the Gideon's army look like? You know, yeah, most people say you drink like a dog. Okay, yeah, that's, that's more than just drinking like a dog. But what does the Gideon's army look like? And how do we become the Gideon's army? That's where Judges 6, Judges 7, and Judges chapter 8 is going to be very critical. Okay, so that'll be next Friday. And then the subsequent Friday, I primarily want to talk about 1 Peter 4.17. For years, we have been talking about judgment begins with the house of God. I, as, I, as I recall back, last year, we took seven or eight sessions, uh, taught about 
judgment of God. I realized that, wow, God is really your divine wisdom. Okay, I don't know why we stumble into it and begin to teach Him. Because if this is the season and this is the Kairos time where God wants to cause us to enter into our destiny, and more than that, God is, one of, God is divinely upgrading us, you know, we have to go through a time of judgment. No, judgment is not like God is going to, God is going to wipe us out and so on. He's going to purify. He's going to refine. He's going to remove all things that hinders love. That's where I, I felt very strongly I need to talk about 1 Peter 4.17. We are really in the 1 Peter 4.17 moment you know, where, where judgment begins with the house of God. We need to have understanding so that we will not fear. Of course, we need to go low because the judge is here. But we also need to embrace the north wind of God. The Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 16. Because the judgment fire of God is good. That's what Hebrews chapter 12 talk about. You know. It's judgment, it's discipline, it's removal of everything that hinders and also creating the very fear of God within us, which is one of the great promises uh, uh, for the end of the age uh, uh, from Jeremiah chapter 32. So that's where we're going to talk about for the next three weeks. Then after that, uh, there's, there are much more things that we're going to talk about. Okay, Because before promotion and upgrade, if you look at the Bible, the biblical principle before promotion and upgrade, there's always that judgment, there's always the purifying, there's always the discipline, there's always the pruning. So that we come out spotless, blameless, found worthy to walk into the fullness of God's destiny. You know, like Moses that walked into Mount Sinai, you know, with fire that's burning, God is inviting us to walk into that fire of God even in this season because it's going to be good for us. Amen? Okay, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. Today, I'm going to talk about the David generation. It's very important for us to understand because this is that destiny and the call that God has for the end time generation. But you want to understand the David generation, there are three very important passages that is pivotal. Jeremiah 3.15, which gives us that clearest prophetic insight or picture or definition of what is the end time church. Of course, Daniel 11 verse 32 and 33 too, and John 17 too, but Jeremiah 3 15 probably give us one of, no, probably give us the clearest insight and prophetic picture. Okay. One is Jeremiah 3 15. The second is actually Isaiah 55 verse 4 which point us to David as a model. And we need to understand. And of course, the third one, which is Psalms 18. Psalms 18, where Psalms 18 tell us and give us the divine pattern and roadmap of how do we become the David generation. If Jeremiah 3.15 says that the end time generation is David, and then if Isaiah 55 verse 4 says David is the mother, we need to understand Psalms 18 because Psalms 18 is the doorway, is the path, is the divine pattern for us to become the David generation. Take me to Jeremiah 3.15. Jeremiah 3, 15. Okay. Clearest prophetic insight and picture of how, what God is going to do to the end time church. Who are we as an end time generation? Not primarily Joseph. Yes, there's a certain element about Joseph. But if you go back to the Bible, the Bible spoke very clearly is called the David generation in accordance with Jeremiah 3.15. Not Joshua generation. Yes, there's a certain element about Joshua. 
but it's about the David generation. Neither is it the Daniel generation. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. Jeremiah 3, verse 15 says this. You know, I always feel very encouraged every time I read this verse because uh, more than just it promised that 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 kind of people that God is going to raise up at the end of the age. And the invitation is to all because it's the, the word shepherds is plural. Okay? I, uh, I, every time I read this verse, I will personalize it and put my name there. Not changing the Bible. Uh, just basically personalize it. Okay? Jeremiah 3, 15. I mean, Jeremiah 3, verse 15. I will give you shepherds according to my own heart. Sounds like who? David. David. Obviously, is pointing to David because there's only one man in the Bible whom God defined him as the man after my own heart or as the man in accordance to my own heart. Okay, let me read finish because the context of Jer- the book of Jeremiah, okay, especially this verse, is written, the context is at the end of the age where God promised that He's going to raise up a, a, a kind of leader that will be like David, that will be a gift to the people of God, to the corporate body of Christ, to the nation of Israel, and they're going to lead because they know God and they walk in intimacy with God. They are men and women after God's very own heart. Verse 15, Jeremiah 3. I will give you shepherds according to my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Obviously, pointing to David as a model. Jeremiah 3.15 is clearly and specifically referenced David as the kind of people that God is raising up at the end of the age. And this is going to be very crucial in this Kairos time where God is opening the door for us to enter unto. Turn me to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 God specific again Isaiah Isaiah 55 is actually written in the context of end of the age. If you read verse 4, no, if you read verse 5, you know, it's in the context of the end time generation. And verse 4 is one of the eschatological promise. Because verse 5 talks about nations will turn to Israel. They will go after Israel. So verse 4 really is in the context of end of the age where uh, through prophet Isaiah reveals clearly that they, God raised up David in the past so that he is the model for us to become. The kind of model weakness, not W-E-A-K-N-E-S-S, uh, uh, even though David is weak, okay, it's W-I-T-N-E-S-S, it's the, the kind of model person or people that God is going to raise up at the end of the age. That's why understanding the life of David is going to be very critical. Okay, Isaiah 55 verse 4 says this, Indeed, I've given him as a witness to the people, pointing to the end of the age. Okay, The people can be referring to the people of God. The people can be referring to the nation of Israel. One more time, they're going to ra- God is going to raise up the greatest king ever, I mean, of course, outside of Jesus, okay? The greatest king ever in the nation of Israel, or rather in the history of the nation of Israel. And this time, it's going to be many. Verse 4 says this, Indeed, I have given him a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. One of the great, eschatological promise of the kind of generations that God is raising up at the end of the age. The David generation. Shepherds according to my own heart. Turn me to Psalms 18. Psalms 18. Okay. If 2024 is the time of open door, of course, I, this few weeks, I want to primarily 
talking about the horizontal door that God wants us to enter into. Then after that, it's like Word of the Lord 2024 Part 2. I want to address that vertical door that we ascend. Okay? If 2024 is a time of open door where God is inviting His people to enter into our destiny as the David generation, Psalms 18 is going to be the very important and pivotal passage of Scripture for the now. 50 verses, but full of information, the process, and also the pattern of how does David look like, how do we become David, and how does God train and prepare him to be the man after his own heart. The only man in the entire Bible that God called him a man after God's own heart. This passage of Scripture is like the guide that empower and enable the end time church to be the David generation. Going to be absolutely pivotal. Okay, Give you five. Today, primarily, I'm going to just give you in brief in introduction, uh, snapshot, and uh, 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 run through quickly. Okay, I want to say run through briefly. Yeah, briefly and quickly. Because it's, there's so much. We'll find a time to come back, okay, to talk about this. Anyway, many years ago, uh, I can't remember, we, we, we taught on the life of David part one, as well as life of David part two. Okay, uh, Psalms 18 is one of the very critical for us to understand David, okay? Your husband wants to specialize in the life of David, right? Okay, ask him to teach. Okay, Psalms 18. Okay, I go, I'm going to give you five reasons why Psalms 18 is so important in this time and hour and also becoming the David generation. Then I'm going to give you a brief introduction and overview. Then run through quickly the 50 verses in the context of becoming David generation, in the context of this is the doorway for us to enter into the destiny as the David generation, okay, in less than an hour. So God help me. Okay, five reasons why Psalms 18 is so pivotal. Okay, the first one, the first one. Because Psalms 18 gives us that divine understanding of how does end time David generation firstly overcome in the face of trouble, crisis, and persecution? Because we will face trouble, crisis, persecution too. You know, we talked about John 16. John 15, verse 18 to John 16, verse 4, Jesus promised us that we will face a world that's going to be hostile to us. David is a model because in the life of David, he has many crises, he has many persecution, he has many betrayal, he has many disappointment, parents forsake him, and so on and so on. How does he, in the midst of all this, I, I counted there are about 17 occasions. I mean, by, for me, I, mean, I kind of tell, my, tell myself, maybe after four or five, uh, I probably I become so toxic really. Because David, because David know how to overcome, the Lord taught him. That's why it's very important, the first reason, which is twofold, divine understanding of how end time David generation overcome in the face of trouble, crisis, and persecution. It's going to be critical. No, no, I'm, I'm saying this out of concern, not out of criticism. I look at especially the younger generation we are very fragile. We get offended very easily. We get hurt very easily. What is going to come is going to be very challenging if we do not know how to overcome all this crisis and challenging time. We will be big time offended, big time hurt, big time bitter. That's why this is important. Okay, divide the first one. Divide understanding of how end time David overcome in the face of trouble, crisis, and persecution. And the second one, how 
end time David become a first one is overcome, second is become a man after God's own heart. One of the clearest divine root map and blueprint. Verse by verse of 50 verses. Okay, so that's the first reason. Second reason. Second reason. <coughs> Give us the divine pattern of how God empower and stabilizes the heart of the David generation. Later I'll talk about it, no, because there will be many storms, many challenges, many pressure. Just like David faced many storm, conflict, and pressure, how God stabilized our heart and how God empower more than just stabilize, empower so that we rise above the storm. Not fighting it, but walking through the storm with joy, with peace, with the pleasure of the Lord. So there's a second one. Third reason. Third reason. Give us the divine model of how, how do we carry our heart. Divine model of how do we carry our heart as the end time generation. If you read Acts 16 verse 24, Paul said this, you know, I'm, I, I, I am blameless or my conscience is clear before God and man. It's very important for us to learn how to carry our heart. You know, we, we, when we talk about David, you know, there are certain things about David that it is his check, signature statement or his trademark. Of course, he's a man after God's own heart. And the second thing about David is that David is someone who has confidence in the Lord. Not in himself, but in the Lord. Third one is David always inquire of the Lord. And the fourth one, which is going to be very critical with all the pressures that we're going to face and, and even the increasing of betrayal. And I was reading a a prophetic uh, 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 statement by the Council of Prophets which is led by Cindy Jacob and so on. One of the things that they believe that 2024, there will be increasing of betrayal. They say, wow, you know. They put Matthew chapter 24, verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I say, wow, you know, God has been telling us about Matthew chapter 24. So this chapter is going to be very important because it gives us the divine model of how do we carry our heart before God and before man. If you read Psalms 18, David consistently used the word that he, is blameless. he was blameless. Okay, There's two aspects that he was blameless before God. One is before God, one is before man. It's going to be very important because it teaches us how to carry our heart. Then the fourth one, fourth one, divine insight into the promises of God for the end time David generation. They are promises of God. Okay, I'm gonna when I come to this part, it's as brief as I can. Okay, but there are promises that we need to hold on to because it strengthens, it encourages, and it inspires us. Okay, and the last one, last one. Divine revelation of Jesus' glory at His return. It's like the Isaiah 4 verse 2, Messianic promise, where the Bible said the branch of Yahweh is beautiful and glorious. Even through this Psalms, we have the revelation of His glory that causes us to always feel with hope and also yearning, you know, until the very end. These are the five uh, reasons why Psalms 18 is so important and so pivotal for us to walk through this open door to become the David generation in this time. Verse, but there are 50 verses. Verse by verse is like the gift and the treasure that God has given to us for us to posture our heart position our heart, whether we meditate, we pray, or use it to have conversation with God, or at the place of abiding, or the confessing and the declaring that we become. And we, if you turn John 16 verse 15, where it talks about the Holy Spirit will take 
everything of Jesus and declare to us, this is going to be the time and season that the Spirit of God, as we posture our heart, is going to take some of these verses and promises and principle in Psalms 18 and it's going to declare unto us. And as He declared to us, like the very Word of God that gives life and brings forth transformation, that we're going, to do, we're going to change, we're going to become the David generation. Okay, okay. brief introduction and overview of Psalms 18. Because my heart is not just, yeah, we are going to be David generation. But the key is how, what is the process so that we can walk through because having that revelation, knowing the promise is one thing. But we, if we don't know the process of, or the pathway to become, you know, it will cause us to be discouraged and disillusioned. It's like hope deferred, make the heart sick. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm going to give, I'm going to run, I, I'm going to run through the brief uh, outline of this Psalms 18 because it's going to be critical for the next few years for us to engage it so that we become, okay? Give you a brief introduction, overview of Psalms 18 and then the outline where I'm going to run through briefly uh, verse by verse, okay? Yeah, it's so important for us to understand so that we engage with God. Of course, Psalms 18, understand the context of Psalms 18 and also the background is very important, okay? Because we need to know what David went through. What just happened when he wrote Psalms 18? Okay, because he just went past two very important events, okay? Psalms 18 is written by, of course, by David, okay? If you read the headline of Psalms 18, it will tell you that it's written by David. It's, uh, of course, it's written sometime around 1 Samuel chapter 31 or 2 Samuel chapter 1. Okay, it's probably a day or two after Saul's death. Saul was killed by, uh, uh, I think it's Amalekite, if I didn't get it wrong, or Philistine. Yeah, when he went to the battle. Okay, it's probably a day or two. cannot be on the same day. Okay, some theologians believe it's on the same day. I think it's after a day or second day where Saul was, was killed, okay, that David wrote these Psalms. And the context is very critical. The context is, uh, in, is in the context of two very dramatic events where David was being delivered from two things. Both are very critical. Okay. One is... He's, he was being delivered from being persecuted and pursued by King Saul to kill him for about seven years. Suddenly, he was delivered. The word suddenly is going to be critical because even in this decade where God prepared us, Things going to be seems very difficult. Remember, I said this is going to be a season of preparation. We all like to say, "Yay!" You know. He's going to expose, he's going to discipline, he's going to refine, he's going to impart, you know, there are ups and downs, you know, but in the moment of very difficult time, if we know that this is what God is doing, don't quit. Because in God, to us is suddenly, to God is at his timing. That's what happened to David. That's why this two event is going to be very critical because everything seems to be falling apart. You must know that the season of David, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, 15, uh, 1 Samuel 16, you know, that was about 12, uh, about 12 years, uh, I kind of lost track. That was about uh, 13, 12 or 13 years ago. He was being prophesied by, uh, not King Saul, he was being prophesied by Samuel that he's going to be the king of Israel, you know. After that, he went through, uh, he went through pro prosperity and increase for a while. Then after that, everything go downhill, and that's where he was at his third season, where he's at the cave of Abdullam, being chased by King Saul, and he went into the place of compromise. And it's, it's at the place most of us will quit. And suddenly, God broke through, and he walked into his destiny. 
Why I'm sharing this is very important because you, this, this decade is going to be exciting of preparation. But there are times that it's going to be challenging. If you do not hold on to the very promise of God, knowing that if this is the promise of God, if God is preparing us to enter into our destiny, when all things seem to be bad, and our vision is not clear and blur, and we don't have confidence that God who leads us is able to bring into our destiny, we're going to jump out of the pan of fire. We, will, we have to hang in there, and suddenly... Just as God delivered David, He is going to deliver us. And we come out, become. Like a song of Song 8.5. Who is this coming out of the wilderness? You know, where she went through fire, trials and testings. Suddenly. Suddenly. This is very important. So David read, wrote, that's why this, the context is very important. David wrote this Psalms uh, uh, after the other source death, uh, in the context of two dramatic events, both are did God deliver him. The first one is God deliver him from being persecuted and pursued by Saul. It set the pattern of how God would deliver us in the most difficult time. And the second event. Second event, which is God deliver him from Ziklag. Ziklag. If we are familiar with the life of David, okay, uh, the reason he went to Ziklag is because he compromised for 16 months. See, God is going to use to both this event to refine us, to cultivate our confidence in Him, to test and settle our heart, and to experience the grace and goodness of God, just as you use this to event, so that David come out, make ready to be the king of Israel. The very classic verse that David described about goodness of God is Psalms 18 verse 35. What does it say? It's the gentleness of God that has made him great. Because God led him gently. The first event is he delivered David from, no, he delivered Saul from David. The second one is God delivered him from the 16 months of spiritual compromise in Ziklag. Primarily because of fear, depression, and despair. You realize that there is that prophetic similarity right now. Why is this decade of 2020? We call it Revelation 3.20 moment, isn't it? Why is it the Revelation 3.20 moment? Because God is going to confront the very people of God so that He is going to deliver us from the lions, no, not lion, from, yeah, d- deliver us from lions is good too, but deliver us from the Laodicean spirit of compromise. It's like, a, it's like much of the people right now, the people of God, is in that global zigzag season at the place of compromise. That's why we need to pray. It seems hopeless and so on, but if God is able to deliver David from that ziglet place of compromise, He is going to be able to deliver us even from the Laodicean spirit of compromise in accordance with Revelation chapter 3. This chapter is so critical that suddenly in the global ziglet season, just as David was delivered, Jesus will deliver the church who is in the spirit of compromise and, and will arise the David generation. Is it even possible? Read Revelation 18. Out of the harlot that came forth the bride of Christ. Why Psalms 18 is going to be critical. That's where we need to pray. It seems like everything is hopeless and bleak and, and, and whatever. You know. The people of God seem to be walking in weakness. You know. But as God delivers David from Ziklag, He's going to deliver the church that will arise the David generation. Okay. Three primary 
wow, that one I take so much time. But it's very important. Okay, so that when you look at Psalms 18, you know that Psalms 18 is going to be very critical. Three primary applications of Psalms 18. Three primary applications of Psalms 18. Of course, David is about the life of David. Give us an insight and understanding of what David experienced with God as a man after God's own heart. He's, this is like a pattern. Like a model. Okay? It's like, not a mirror. Uh, uh, it's like, like a road map. As we look at David, but of course, the, the, the number one application is uh, the life of David. <laughs> Second application is the end time church. For the end time church. If you read carefully, much of Psalms 18 has not been fulfilled in the life of David, but it will be fulfilled for the people of God at the end of the age. So the second application is the end time church, or we can call it uh, uh, the David generations, okay, where it give, it, it is, it's there to inspire and enable us to participate with the work of the Holy Spirit in becoming the David generation. It's a roadmap, it's a blueprint, it's the pattern. The third one, third one, is, third application is Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. At His second coming, this is one of the Messianic Psalms. So in a way, we are like the forerunner, you know, preparing for the coming of Jesus. This is how Jesus looked at, of course, pale in comparison. Okay? If you study carefully, verse 4 and 5 is the prophetic picture of Jesus' death. Verse 7 to 19 is the picture of His resurrection and so on and so on. Okay? So primarily, the third application is about uh, uh, Jesus at His second coming. Okay, okay turning me to Psalms 18. Psalms 18. I'm going to go quick. Okay, I'm going to give you the outline and then after that, I'll run through verse by verse just as usual. Snapshot and uh, I won't even say quickly. It's going to be swiftly. <laughs> okay, yeah. Verse 1 to 3. Verse 1 to 3. God's leadership over David. God's leadership over David. Powerful prophetic insight of how God will lead the end time church. We're going to need that. Verse 1 to 3. God's leadership over David. Verse 4 to 6. We don't like this. Verse 4 to 6. David's trouble. David's trouble. Why are the bell? <laughs> David's trouble. Prophetic patterns of trouble, conflict, crisis, uh, persecution, betrayal, etc., etc., that the end time church will face. Okay. Well, it's better to know now than we are actually surprised. Like, dear caught, uh, I always gotta get the line right, huh? Dear caught in the, uh, dear in the headlight. Okay, whatever. Okay. Verse seventeen to fifteen. Verse seventeen to fifteen. Revelation and manifestation of the ah, verse seven to fifteen. What did I say? 15, okay, so prophetic. Okay. Uh, so verse 7 to 15. Verse 7 to 15. Revelation and manifestation of the majestic, heavenly, storm like glory and beauty. Is that is the way that God is going to strengthen our heart, deliver us, and intervene in our affairs. Okay, so that's verse 7 to 15. Verse 16 to 18. Verse 16 to 18. David's history with God. You know, this, is very, this is very encouraging because the same history that David had with God, we are going to have. Because verse 16 to 18, primarily David shared about his testimony of how God delivered him and also his history with God. Likewise, we will have the same history and even far surpass David. Because we are great, we are, the end time generation is going to far surpass even the David of old. Okay, so read this. Don't, don't primarily focus on verse 4 and 6, the trouble, you know. And I know someone is going to ask me, does that mean that our trouble far surpass David? 
probably, but don't focus on the trouble, focus on the glory. Hey guys, don't be so negative. Okay, yeah. Like Paul say, you know, it, the temporary light affliction is but pale in comparison to the eternal weight of glory. Okay, just swallow your saliva. Okay, verse 19, uh, or oh, you are gup. Okay, verse 19 to 24. Verse 19 to 24, David's confidence in God's leadership okay, is the model of how God leads us. We need to have confidence in God's leadership. That's why, you see, people don't pray, it's because we lack confidence and trust in God. David prayed a lot. In all his crises, he prayed. Because he has confidence in God's leadership. Verse 25 to verse 27. Verse 25 to verse 27. David's response in the midst of trouble, persecution, and crisis is a very important model. How we carry our heart before God and man. Then verse 28 to verse 45. God's promises for David. God's promises for David. Full fulfillment will be at the end of the age for the David generation. It's something that we can claim. And verse 46 to verse 50, the glory and the beauty of Jesus at his second coming. Okay, take me to Psalms 18. Psalms 18, verse 1 to 3, primarily about God's leadership over David. It's a very important three verses. I have been just primarily meditating on these three verses over the last few weeks at uh, uh, our devotional session because it's loaded. It's so rich. Also, that divine root map pattern or whatever you call it, in we growing in our confidence in God's leadership by we being empowered that we become men after God's own heart. Because through these three verses, it reveals the seventh facet of God's leadership over David's life. And that empower him firstly to have confidence in God. And secondly, explain the reason why he loved God. Do you know that if you read Psalms 18 verse 1, what's the first verse? I will love you, Yahweh. Some versions will say NIV, I love you. Basically, David is tell. no, of course, it's, it's, it, 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 there are many things about just this one verse. David is telling God that he loved God. But of course. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Let me just go further. He's also explaining the reason why he loved God. But we often miss something about this verse. Search the Bible. This is the only verse in the entire Bible where a man say, I love God. Everywhere else in the Bible, when the commandment or whatever pertaining to loving God is an exhortation for us to love Him. Of course, we are familiar with Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6. Shema Israel is an exhortation for us to love God. Moses didn't say, I love God. If you go to Matthew chapter 22, it's the same. This is the only place in the Bible that a man proclaimed that I love God. Of course, like, you know, I know everybody raise your eyes. This verse tells us two things. First of all, David loved God, right? of course. No, they tell us David loved God, of course, but there's a, there's a power in it. Only one place that a man say, I love God in the Bible. And then also tell us why David was empowered to love God. Because he, have, he encountered this seventh, seventh facet of God's leadership. And a lot of time when he shared, he's erupt, he, he can't help it. 
he's overwhelmed and erupt and overflowing with the emotion. You know, it's like he's sharing, you know, Liu, you know, let me tell you about these prophetic promises. I said, oh God, I love you. And after that, faith, you know, whatever, why are you, you too loud? You know? Yeah, faith, you know, I tell you this, this, this one, oh, I love you, God. is like, God, like, what are you, all, what are you doing? Can I, are you out of your mind? Because he's so filled with gratitude and thanksgiving because he see the leadership of God in his life. It shouldn't be him. Remember we say, no, not we say, the Bible's in 1 John 4, 19 say, we love God because He first loved us. See, one thing about the end time, one thing about David is more than just confidence in God's leadership. David is the man who loved God. He's the lover of God. And these three verses give us the key. This is not about we grind, bite, bite the bullets, grind out, okay, love God, love God. He cannot help it because he encounters the leadership of God. He has evidence in the leadership of God in his life. That's why this is so crucial. And the key is this. He say what? I love you who? Who? You see, a lot of time we miss it. Yahweh. He's using the covenanted name of God. He didn't just say, I love you, God. Covenanted name of God is both personal and also powerful and confidence of the faithfulness of God. That's why Isaiah 55 verse 3, classic picture of how David is being led, the sure mercy of David. Because of these three verses, that's why it's very crucial. No, I'm not asking us that casually to say, oh, I love you, Yahweh, Yahweh, but it's an encounter. The name Yahweh is the covenanted name of God with Israel. When Israel called God Yahweh, they fully understand what it is about. He's faithful. He's transcendent. That means he's all-powerful. And more than that, he's loving and tender. That is that all, the all part. That is that loving, affectionate part. That is that having confidence in Him. That's why this is very crucial. Oh God, I love you. Yahweh, I love you. When I realize this, then I begin to realize I'm so thankful because last year God began to direct us to focus on the nine aspect of His name through Psalm 33. Whether it's Yahweh Ra'a, Yahweh Shalom, Yahweh Jaira, and so on and so on. He said, wow, God, you are leading us on this path of King David. Okay, oh goodness, better go fast. Okay, yeah, seven, seven facet or seven dimension of God's leadership that is vital for us to be rooted and grounded become David generation because it establishes our confidence in God's leadership as well as it produces our love for God. No, it's more than just for us to understand and study, for us to encounter. Okay, uh, I'm going to do quickly. Strength, rock, fortress, deliverer, shield, salvation, high tower. Some, I, I'll be very honest with you, some I'm not too enthusiastic. You know why not? If you need strength, that means what? You probably are wavering and so on. If you need to be delivered, it's, uh, if you need to stand the rock, you know, uh, but, but yes, like I said just now, north wind, south wind, all I want is to become the very people that you are raising up. Okay? Strength, rock, fortress, deliverer, shield, salvation, high tower. I'm going to run through briefly, but go and find out more and engage God. And talk to Him. Of course, He will bring you to the place of transformation. So what I've been doing in the prayer room is praying, Oh Yahweh, You are my strength. You are my strength. And the Lord will re remind me over, over the years, you know, I've been walking with the Lord for 30 over years, remind me of incident where I waver and about to quit. He Lift me up because He's my strength. That's a key thing. Okay, strength. Primarily, He sustained us. 
He uphold us by His grace. You know, like the Isaiah 40 verse 28 to 37. Okay. It's very important to David. You know why? David could have quitted often. Because he had many fear. He has all, I mean, I mean some say, uh, faith, this is just a joke. La. Faith have a glimpse of it last year, Christmas. Uh, uh, husband go away, her father, mother, daughter, Ralph, uh, a brother forsake both with girlfriend, you know, uh, Psalms 27 become real, you know, my father and mother forsake me, you know, this is a joke. Okay, okay, bye, uh, Liu, please buy her dinner. Okay, after the fast first, okay. There are many reasons why David would have quitted. You see, one of the greatest work of the devil to come against us is to cause us to quit. That's why Zechariah 3 and 4 is so important. Joshua and Zerubbabel quitted because they were discouraged. God gives them strength. It's so important. So that's where our hope and our confidence, my confidence is not in my ability. My confidence is that if God has called me, I just have to hang in there. Oh, that sounds like lack of joy. No, I just have to hang in there because He's going to deliver me. Some of you know my, my story way back in the 90s. I was on the, just a few minutes before I quit. If that happened, uh, I really don't know who I am right now. At the very last moment. No, because I was so discouraged. I was so down. But God sent help. And He strengthened me. And over the years, I mean, I'll tell you there are moments that... <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I think a lot about is quit. Last 10 years become better. Yeah, but always it's the Lord who strengthens us. So the first one is strength. Strength. <clears throat> yeah, that's what, they, not, not David, that's what Jesus prayed for us in John 17 verse 12, isn't it? He prayed that I will keep, Father, I pray that you will keep them from stumbling. He's going to be our strength. Second, the rock. He's our rock. More and more, it's going to be critical to stand on the rock of Jesus. As many shifting sand, many storms, and so on. Primarily, is the word of God, is the truth of God. He's going to let it be one true, reliable foundation that we can stand. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says what? All things will fade away except the word of God. Word about who he is. Word, uh, word about who, about his character, about his promises and his narrative for us. Okay, we, we cannot hear it from somewhere else. We have to hear it from the very truth and the word of God is upon this rock of truth that we stand. He's going to come as a rock. Jesus as a rock is going to be one important revelation at the end of the age because storm is coming, shaking is coming. That's the key thing. Third one, fortress, fortress. Fortress, you must think the, you must think the context of Better. No one built fortress in peacetime. Okay. In the context of better, okay. Fortress is strong. You know? Now there's no fortress that's strong because weapon weapon has become so advanced. Uh, you know. uh, you've just fired one rocket or missiles, uh, everything is gone. But you must think ancient time. Fortress if is a safe place. A place you can find. Rest. That's a key. You must, you must think David. Okay, backtrack a little bit. You must think ancient time. When they fight war, they put on the armor. They don't take down their armor. The only place they take down their armor, do you know, is where? Fortress. Because it's safe. No darts can come in and so on. And that's the place where they can rest. Okay. You know, we are, I'm not talking about we're going to find a place for trust. You know? No, I'm talking about we must consistently abide in the fortress of God. 
That means who He is. That we will feel safe. We will feel the sense of rest and peace and joy. That's why one of the sessions I'm going to talk about is how do we enter into the rest of God. It's going to be critical. Okay, it's going to be critical. Fourth one. Fourth one. Deliverer. Deliverer. Okay, there's a difference between deliverer and shield. Okay, deliverer is primarily major. Shield is more personal, uh, day-to-day affairs. Because shield is used for what? Close combat. Yeah, shield a lot of time is to deal with daily issue, personal conflict, and, and specific attack of the mind, emotion, and so on. That's where, where, where David do have many of this personal conflict. But God will shield us. That's the key thing. You see, the key is, later I'll show you a verse. The key is we learn to walk with God. We don't fight back. That's why David understood all these things. We are a lot of time tired and we do not enter the place of rest is because we are fighting on our behalf. But we need to let God fight for us or fight on our behalf so that we walk in the place of rest. Okay, so shield primarily is a protection against specific attack. Often it's personal and day-to-day. And then deliverance. Deliverance. That means deliverance from major issue in our life. It shouldn't be a lot. In our whole life, walk with God, probably there are two or three incidents where God actually deliver you big time. I would say 1995 is a major deliver, deliverance. No, deliverance is not casting out demon. Nah. It delivers you from major issue that will cause you to be crashed. We're gonna have we're gonna have some in the days ahead. How did God deliver David from Saul, from Ziklag, and what's the third one? Absalom. Then made three major deliverance that David faced. You know, primarily major crisis, pressure, so on and so on. Okay, you know, especially we are at the age where many things are being shaken. That's a key thing. Okay, six, salvation. The word salvation is not primarily about accepting Jesus as Savior, but breakthrough. Breakthrough. The breakthrough of promises, you know, that God has even for us. Going to be very critical. And the last one, last one. Uh, Actually, the better translation is high tower. Okay, you know, in fortress, there are certain places that is called high tower where they put the sentry or the watchman where they can see far. Okay, This is very important because God will place us at the place where we can see far. See far, see high. See high is we see Him. See far is we see the bigger picture of what God has for us. Because this is very important so that we will not be shaken. People can betray us. People can put us in prison. People can shortchange even our path of advancement. People can rob us. People can put us in, oh, I see, they put us in prison. People can kill us. You know, If we are able to see far into our pers- eternal perspective, we will not be robbed we will have the confidence in the Lord. So these are the seven facets of David's confidence, uh, seven facets of where David encountered the leadership of God. That's very important for us to cultivate so that we have confidence that will give rise to the love even for the Lord. Okay, verse 4 to 6. I'm going to go quickly. Verse 4 to six, which is David's trouble. David's trouble. Prophetic picture of trouble, crisis, persecution, etc. that David's generation will face. Primarily fourfold. Okay, fourfold. But verse six is how we respond. Fourfold. Fourfold trouble that we will face. First one is pangs of death. Pangs of death. That means persecution or even martyrdom. Yeah. 
not all will be martyred, like, okay, so don't worry. Yeah, if you're martyred, we're never going to die, you know. Uh, it won't be the majority. <laughs> That's why. If majority, then where do we go? You know, how do we even partner with the Lord? Okay, so of course we need to be prepared to. Pens of death. Second, floods of ungodliness. That means there's going to be an increase of darkness. In all aspect, moral, value, spiritual, iniquity, and so on and so on. Daniel 8.23 talks about the fullness of iniquity. Okay, we're going to face all that. Yeah. Uh, third one, sorrows of Sheol. Sorrow of Sheol. That Jesus actually emphasized a lot on that. Where, whether it's in John 16, he used the term sorrows. And then, uh, whether it's Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, we talk about the five four negative emotion that is going to sweep across the generation. Luke 21, Jesus warned us, you know, Watch out for all this that you will not weigh us down like a trap, okay? David went through all that. He had fear. That's the reason why he ran to Abdullam. He went into depression and so on and so on. Okay. Psalms 18 actually is the pathway for us, you know. I'm not, I'm not against counseling, so don't get me wrong. Counseling is not going to solve many of the issues. But there's going to be a global depression, mental health issue because of pressure. Okay, many people will turn, you know what's the way they will turn to? Either cyber to escape. That's why metaverse is going to be something that going to, I mean, I mean, it's not the answer. Another thing is drugs. The only way to overcome is to engage God using verse 1 and 3 where He's our strength, our rock, and so on and so on. So that's verse 4 to 6. Okay, Verse 6 gives us a very powerful insight that how we should respond as the David generation in times of crisis. Call upon God. Call upon God. We don't call upon God is because we don't trust Him. We lack confidence in Him. Okay, I found a session to talk about Daniel 9 because Daniel 9 is going to be critical. Daniel 9 gives us the pattern of how we pray in the midst of crisis. Okay, I'm going to read verse 6. Verse 6. In my distress, I call upon Yahweh. This is a pattern of David if you read Psalms. There's a typical pattern of David, you know, in many of his psalms. He will complain, lament. Then he always pray. Then after that, he will rise with confidence. He's calling upon him. Verse 6, In my distress, I call upon Yahweh and cry out to my God. He heard my voice from his temper and my cry came before him even to his ears. You must think of someone who is in absolute, total distress. When you're in that state of mind and emotion, you don't think clearly. That's why it's so important for us to have the confidence in the Lord so that when we pray, we have the confidence that He hears. And in the right time, He's going to break in. That's going to stabilize our heart. So that's verse 4 to verse 6. David's trouble and also how David responds in time of trouble. It's time that we actually cultivate that so that when trouble comes, our instant response, our second nature is, God! Help me! And our prayer can be clear. That's the key. If now it's a... I, I don't know whether you have before. I have. You know, there are moments uh, in the past where Oh, I'm so panicky. I don't even know how to pray. I can't read the Bible. You know, all I read is like, oh, let's read through. The, you know, five chapter. Yeah, I read the five chapter in one minute. You know, uh, they call it what speed read. Yeah, that's why it's so important. That's why Paul said, "Be sober." It's cultivating the confidence. Okay, verse seven to eighteen. Verse seven to eighteen is how God 
respond to the cry of David. I'll find a time, you know, I really want to find a time to come back to talk about the beauty of God, the beauty of Jesus, you know, whether it's Revelation 4 and 5 or even uh, 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 Psalm 7 verse 18 because this is a pattern of just like how God delivered and intervened David's life through the manifestation of His glory. That's how God going to deliver us at the end of the age. Okay, give you some passages of Scripture because this is real. This is real. Revelate, no, Psalm 7 verse 18 is a reality. It talks about both the revelation and the manifestation. What, bef- what is before the very throne of God? You know, I call it the majestic, heavenly, storm-like glory. You know, because around the throne, if you read Revelation 4 and 5 or Daniel 7, around the throne, there's thunder, thundering, lightning, voices, uh, a light sound. Not just a theology, but it's a reality. And even if we think there's reality, a lot of time we think that, oh, it's only in the spirit realm or heavenly realm. There are occasions that God will break in with the manifestation of this storm-like glory to deliver us. Just write this down. Ezekiel 1, Revelation 4 and 5. Job 26. I love the last verse of Job, Job 26. He did all the things. They say it's but a mere whisper. But when God is full of zeal for us, what does He do? He thundered the storm like manifestation of His glory before His throne. It's going to manifest in our midst, okay? It's the key strat- is a, is a key. No, key and at strategic moment when God, three reasons, when He intervened, when He advanced His kingdom, when He shifts human history, that, that is where the glory before His throne, He break forth. Or when He wants to intervene for us. That's what happened in Psalms 18. Has it happened before? Remember uh, X Stevens, I think it's X 6. The heaven was rolled back and they encountered the very glory of God. And then what does Revelation 6 say? The heaven will be rolled back and men, kings, all become fearful. They begin to hide in caves where God breaks in. Okay, Ezekiel 1, Revelation 4 and 5, Job 26, uh, Acts 2, verse 19 and 20, where smoke, uh, fire, and so on, blood, and whatever. You know, I'm not talking about literal blood, uh, but all these are real. That where God is going to break in and deliver. And He broke in uh, uh, often even to deliver the saints of old. Okay? Yeah, just three examples. First one is Moses, where God uh, where God advanced His redemptive plan. He came down like fire on Mount Sinai, okay, where a nation is being birthed. Okay. The second, second, when God shifts history, when God shifts history, Haggai 2, verse 6 to 9. Haggai 2, Verse 6 and 9. Also, Revelation 12. No, Revelation 6, verse 12 to 14, you know, uh, uh, where the heaven, heavenly window was rolled back like scratch. I mean, I tell you, that would be amazing. It's terrifying and amazing. Terrifying for those who resist the Lord. That's why all the kings, all, you know, people. Believer, okay, this is just a joke. Don't take it too seriously. If you feel that I'm talking about you, don't be offended. No. Believers shouldn't be buying cave and hide. Read Revelation 6. It's those who are against the Lord. When that glory comes, they all begin to hide in the cave. And you know what they say? Let the, let the stone come down and crush and seal the door. And I'm not against buying cave, but I'm not... I'm, we shouldn't be hiding because God is going to deliver us. 
we must have confidence. Okay, yeah, we should buy cave for those who are against God. Just make ready for them. Yeah, okay. So that is the storm like glory, okay? Primarily to advance his redemptive plan. You see it in Moses, you see it in Book of Acts, or shift history, Revelation 6 or Haggai 2, or when he intervened and deliver his people, Psalms 18. Let me just read, Psalm, read quickly. Psalms 18, verse... Oh, go and read on your own. I don't have time. Sometimes I realize it's 545. Psalms 18, verse 7 to... Uh, verse 7 to 15, okay? Then go to Psalms... No, uh, verse 16 to 18. Verse 16 to 18, okay? If this... This message become too long. I break it into two half. La. Okay, then next week I take a break. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, Psalms 16 to no, Psalms 18, verse 16 to 18. David's history with God and testimony of how God delivered him. I tell you, this is in assurance to us way ahead. God will not just deliver us. He already set the plan now for the future where He will deliver us. A plan that is already set. It's kind of like, wow, you know, before I even need deliverance, you already work out the plan. That's why He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He sees the end from the beginning. Before He before he started anything, he has finished everything. Sounds strange, right? Yeah, just go and figure it out. That we can have confidence. Okay, that's where verse 16, 17, and 18. Go to read quickly. <coughs> he sent from above and he took. He must know that. Know why sent from above? The plan is the heavenly plan, it's from above. He really know the scenario way ahead. And more than that, he set the plan. It's from above. It's not kind of like, you know, it's, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's kind of like, oh, I'm being tortured and so on. God, do you know? Okay, okay, then finally I hear you cry, I'm coming. He already knew. And the plan is from above. And he took me out drew me out of many water. I couldn't read Romans 8, verse 28, 30. I tell you, it's, <laughs> theologically it sounds confused, but you figure it out it's very powerful. For new, predestined, chose, glorified. This is like Psalms 18, verse 16 to 18. He knew, and the plan is from above. Verse 17. He delivered, he delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. Don't be, over, don't be overwhelmed by enemy that's far more superior than us. He's going to deliver us. Then verse 18 talks about, He is my support and He brought me to a broad place. That means free of fear, anxiety, but full of peace. Not just small little place where you are wobbly, you know. Have you stand on the high places where you have to watch yourself before you fall off the cliff, that kind of thing. Yeah, but he's going to bring us to a broad place. But the key, David is sharing his history and the testimony of how God will deliver him. It's the plan that has really set in motion and also in place, okay. Verse, verse uh, 19. I must read verse 19. Verse 19 is the key. David said this, He delivered me because he delighted in me. You know why? You know what David is saying? Don't focus on trouble nor unfulfilled dreams. Focus on delighting in God and being a delight to Him. Psalms 37 verse 4. Okay, Delight yourself in Yahweh and He will give you the desire of your heart. Okay, Verse 20 to verse 24. Verse 20 to verse... No, verse 20 to verse 28. 
Okay, it's primarily talking about how David carry his heart before God and man. Going to be absolutely critical. If you read verse 20 to verse 24, in two times, David emphasized the word, I'm blameless. Verse 20 to 24 is about David was being blameless before God. Verse 25 to verse 28, David was blameless before man. How he carried his heart. It's going to be very important, even in this season, because that will help us to ascend. That's Psalm 74, isn't it? Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hand, pure heart, does not lift up his soul to the idol, nor sworn deceitfully. And David gives us a very powerful picture. How? That means we are blameless to expect before God and before man. Verse 22, Verse 20 to 24 primarily is blameless before God. Okay? Where it talks about how do we walk in righteousness? How do we walk in the way of God, which is obedience? And how do we walk blameless before God? Our speech, our thought, our action. And then verse 25 to verse 28 primarily is how David was blameless before God. No, blame, how David was blameless, how he carried his heart before man. It's going to be very critical. That's who David is about. And that's why he entered into the fullness. I'm going to read verse 24 again. I'm going to just go through quickly. It's quite straightforward. Because this is very important. This is the key that we become mature sons of God. And verse 25 to 28 give us four vital law of the kingdom in how we carry our heart before man and how we become the mature sons of God like Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. Okay. Verse 24, David said this, Therefore, Yahweh has recompensed me according to my righteousness and according to the cleanness of my hand in his sight. This verse is not talking about David has no sin, no struggle. This verse talks about how he deals with man and how he carries his heart before man. It's going to be critical for us because we're going to face all kinds of accusations, slander, betrayal, persecution. How do we carry our heart so that we continuously to be blameless? What is David's classic statement? Let God judge between you and me. Let God avenge on you. Three things about David that makes him blameless before man. Okay. Unless we have confidence in the Lord. Okay. First one, David will not vindicate himself. He will not. Second, go and read through the life of David. It's consistent in all this. Second, David will not take revenge on those who mistreated him. That's what Paul said in Romans, uh, Romans 12. Vengeance is the Lord. Okay. Uh, third thing, David will not manipulate or scheme to achieve his goal. You know, that's where... You know, we will be shortchanged, we will lose out, we will be taken advantage in the days to come, you know. How do we carry our heart? Because at the end of the day, we want God to be the one who exhort us. We want God to be the one who promote us. How we carry our heart will determine whether God will promote us and advance us. Don't be in the hurry, okay. That's where verse 25 to 28 David gave four vital laws of the kingdom in how do we carry our heart before God and man. I'm gonna just going to go through quickly. First one, verse 25. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. That means showing mercy even to others 
who mistreat us. Friend, foe, endearing one or enemy. That's how God, just write this now, Luke 6, verse 36 to 38. Luke 6, verse 36 to 38, where it's very scary, this verse. A lot of times we don't read carefully. It's a principle that God actually tells us that how we treat other people is also how He will allow other people to treat us. Wow. I want to show mercy. I want to show mercy. It's going to be very important. Okay, Second one, verse 25, blameless. With the blameless man, you shown yourself blameless. That means we cannot be vindictive. We cannot be vengeful. We must not be manipulative nor scheming. We have to trust God. Yeah. Third one, with the pure, you will show yourself pure. This is not about towards God. Uh. This is towards man. Towards man. That means we have to respond in the purity of our motive. Purity of our thought. Purity of our speech. Okay. It's very important. Last one, verse 26. With the devious, you will show yourself true. Let me explain a bit. What we mean by devious? This is very important because devious people are those who manipulate and scheme to gain advantage or they conspire. Okay. We have to be very careful because sometimes in our desperation, to gain advantage, to gain promotion, or open the door or platform for us, we can operate in the devious spirit towards man. That means we come up with false ideas and lies that embolden us in our agenda and narrative, even though it's not true. You know what's the danger? After a while, we keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. You begin to even buy into our own lies. That's where we are being trapped. That's what the God says. To the, with the devious, I will show myself shrewd. That means God will allow. If you go to Galatians 6, what did God say? God cannot be mocked. Whatever you sow, you reap. So that's how we carry out. We need to be, that, that's, that's why it's very important that we need to know how to carry our heart and have confidence in the Lord and even allow people to take advantage. But our heart has to be pure before God so that eventually we are men and women who know how to carry our heart and God will trust us. You know why? Where He's going to give us authority and power. If we don't have the right heart, we're going to abuse it. That's a key thing. Okay, going to be quick. Verse 28 to verse 45. Promises of God for end time generations. There are eight promises. Eight promises. He will keep our fire burning. He will keep our fire burning. Verse 28. Second, He will guide and direct us. Verse 28. Third, He will strengthen and empower us. Verse 29. Fourth, He will protect us. Verse 13. Fifth, oh, I love this. Okay, now I love it all. Okay, he will train us for better. He will train us for better. Verse 32, verse 34. Six, he will make us great and successful in his sight. In his sight, okay, not in world sight. Seven, he will help us to overrun and over no, he'll help us to overcome and overrun our enemy. God is not just satisfied that we overcome our enemy. He wants us to overrun. It's read carefully, you know. Don't just defeat them, chase them into the sea. Wow, you no. Know, no, if you play games, uh, it's called trash. You don't win one nil, just creep through. Or PK, you know, penalty kick, you know, you trash them by seven nils, eight nils, you know, like. Yeah, the last one. He will fulfill all the promises and the destiny that He has for us. Verse 35 to verse 36. Yeah. Then verse 48 to verse 50 is the revelation of the glory and the beauty of Jesus at His return. 
Amen? These are five very important verses as a doorway for us to enter even unto our destiny as a David generation. Acts 13 verse 22 says this, no, God has found David as a man after God's own heart. The key word is not God raised up, of course, but the key emphasis is God has found. What does it mean? It's not automatic. There is the place where we need to respond. If we respond, we will become. Psalms 18 gives us the key process. If we use it to engage God, we will enter into our destiny as a David generation. Amen? Lord, we thank you even for what you are doing even in this time. I'm asking that this precious, this gift of Psalms 18, may it be that word of yours to go swiftly, especially to the young generation, so that we will take it, engage with your heart, that we will walk unto that reality of that David generation as you describe, as you prophesy in Jeremiah 3.15. We love you, we bless you, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.